All right, call the meeting to order at 5.17 p.m. Uh, Alder Galvin, Alder Hutchison, Alder Johnson are present. Alder Burnett is excused. Entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Galvin, a second by Hutchison. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Motion by Galvin, a second by Hutchison. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Uh, item E, regular business number one, for consideration with possible action to accept the state of Wisconsin subgrant of $36,500 from Federal Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, any questions, elders? Motion to approve. I second. We have a motion by Elder Galvin, a second by Elder Hutchinson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Item two, for consideration of possible action on 2023 2027 capital improvement plan. Uh, I think we're going to take this in sections. Uh, no particular order. Director Ellen Becker, is there a department uh, that you would like to start with? Um, we can, it doesn't matter. We either have, we have the fire department or we have the whole department of public works and all of his departments. So yeah, let's start with fire uh, since that seemed to be Alder Stoyer. Yeah. Point of order. I just came into the meeting, Alder Johnson, and we item number four might not take all that long. And I'm just wondering if there's a way we could amend that to bring three before four or four before three. Make a motion to reconsider the agenda. So move. Second. We have a motion by Hutchison, second by Galvin. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Entertain a motion to amend the agenda. Place so item four after item one. So move. All right. We have a motion by Hutchison, a second by Galvin. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Uh, okay, then we are on to item four, request by Alder Stoyer to the Finance Committee, which states, to discuss with possible action the purchase of an app that predicts the blockage of bridges in downtown railroad crossings. Alder Stoyer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was approached by a citizen, Rob Miller, who had been in touch with Kurt Brandt, who they're both here. Uh, I would like them to kind of speak on, on the matter. Um, as I was coming... <laughs> Under the meeting, there was a train that I had to wait for for some length of time. So we've all enjoyed the experiences of waiting in traffic and being late for meetings, et cetera. And uh, uh, I've heard about this app that uh, Mr. Brandt has utilized in other cities. And I, I would like to entertain the motion that you could listen to both Mr. Miller and Mr. Brandt. And I'll have some other comments as well. Elder Stoyer just... Have you talked to Mike Karanik at all? Because I know yes, that I have. he has done some work on this. He has done some work. And I think there, there, there are some other folks uh, that I have met as well that do this type of work. Um, so it might be one of these situations where if we, if the committee feels that it's important to move ahead with this, that we would look at a couple of other um, vendors possibly for something like this. Um, I think it's uh, a proactive approach to especially our downtown area. Um, so I have talked to Mike Ronick about it as well. So um, he's, he's familiar with this. So I, as far as how he feels about it completely, I'm not 100% sure. I think he is pretty wide open. I think he's so indifferent if council wants I'll to leave fund it. I'll leave it at that. I, I mean, I think Mike will obviously manage it if council you know, chooses to. Right. To, to allocate the funds no, required to, to manage it. So uh, my, my sense is that my sense is that he, he was okay with it one way or the other. You know, he would manage it accordingly, but uh, it all depends on financing. Okay. Uh, obviously, we don't really. I mean, I, I mean, I, appropriate action. I think would just be to refer this to staff, or we could request it an RFP drafted. Uh, but we do have a couple individuals here that sounds like want to speak to it. So I would entertain a motion to open the floor. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion by Hutchinson, a second by Galvin. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the motion carries. Okay, if we have members of the public uh, that would like to speak on this item, please just state your name and your address uh, and uh, feel free to speak. Brian 
Yeah. Yep, go ahead, Rob. Um, I would suggest we start with uh, Dr. Brandt. Uh, he has more information than anyone, and I'll follow him if that's okay with the committee. Yep. Kurt, okay, do you want to yeah. speak? Yes, sure. Great. So uh, I can't speak to um, the protocols and other things that are that you have to um, uh, go through for this process. I just want uh, so, but I just want to mention that we have um answered to the rfp so there was an rfp uh we answered it through our um our distributor tapco which was one of the larger um providers of traffic signals on the, the state so we have gone through some of this process i'm a little confused by it myself um but uh so i'm gonna move on from that uh just his historical piece and uh, say that yes, we you know our application developed over um, somewhere about four years, and we probably put about a million and a half dollars in development of it. it. The origin of the technology came from a project we did for Lockheed Martin, where we solved one of the top five problems in um, uh, managing the F thirty five fighter. So there's some solid technology behind it. And what we're in the process right now of a number of different initiatives in Wisconsin rolling it out, for example, the South, um, all the counties in Southeast Wisconsin. So we're working on a number of these large initiatives where we can roll out uh, the application so that we can not only provide uh, service to, for example, first responders, but also the um, citizens and logistics companies. Um, there, I, I believe Rob Miller forwarded you a one page overview and we have done a ROI analysis on this. Uh, we have a standard ROI analysis we do for cities and we also do um, uh, analysis where we can bring our system out on a temporary basis and measure rail traffic because quite honestly, most cis, cities don't have any information about um, that actual rail traffic other than their their um, personal experience and frustration. So we have um, lots of data on that. Uh, I, um, I try not to make this into a sales pitch, but <laughs> we're just describing what we have. So um, uh, the system works by putting sensors along the crossing outside of um, railroad right away. And it delivers the information in a number of different ways depending on users. So we have mobile applications, we have web applications, we have a Windows application which goes on a screen and that would be used, for example, in the fire department as people uh, get uh, rung in to go out on, a, on, a, on a, a, um, a call. We're also using that same type of screen in some of the businesses in downtown Milwaukee. We're in the current in the process of rolling that out there. And then there's a cloud interface, which um, we're hoping to do a, a pilot study in Rock County with Motorola, which is the largest market share of um, uh, in the U.S. for computer-aided dispatch. And so we have a, a working system in Janesville, and we're hoping that's going to be part of that project. Um, so we have we put out you know a lot of effort in this, and we have um, I think superior technology to, to anything else that we've seen out there. Uh, and I think that our our growth in connected, infra, uh, connected infrastructure is going to be something we're really pushing. Um, the Just to give you a quick history of the interaction with the railroad, um, initially when initially they ignored us <laughs> and then uh, they didn't like us for a while because we were advertising the fact that we we're solving all these problems with congestion, et cetera. So they felt sort of negative. And then they realized that we weren't being negative towards the railroad, just the idea that the crossing hasn't changed in 150 years. So cross bucks were invented in 1867 or patented in 1867. That's when uh, trains first were transcontinental. That's when roads were dirt and traffic was horses. And we still use exactly the same technology in 18, as in 1867 to tell you about when the train is gonna be at the crossing. But obviously the rest of the world has changed quite a bit since then. In 1860, there's a population of 30 million, now it's 300 million. Um, uh, this 
average speed of, of a, something crossing the crossing was four miles an hour because it was horses. And now it's 10 times that or 40 miles an hour. Of course, there's crossings that cars go across much faster. And uh, back then, the highest building was, you know, uh, 50 feet high. And now we have skyscrapers, lighted rows, and, and, and um, the attention span has gone from 20 minutes to nine seconds. So it's a quite different world. However, we haven't changed how we go across crossings. So that's really the goal of our our application is to, to integrate into the way the world is now and to provide safety improvements, um, improvements to citizens productivity. And so losing 10 minutes every time you go crossing is a, is a productivity problem, logistics productivity. And the way I got involved in it first, it had to do with first response. Um, I got a call and met my, at my parents' house and the ambulance driver said, hey, you can go to Waukesha or to Wauwatosa, but if you go to Waukesha, you might get caught by a train. And I couldn't, I didn't even know what to think at that time. And it, that same week we got called from our, our first customer, Final Act Wisconsin, who told us there the emergency response companies get um, uh, blocked, tw uh, uh, sorry, 20% uh, of the time for an average of eight minutes. And I couldn't believe what, what we heard and we, decided, hey, this might be a big problem. We found out it is a big problem. And uh, if you look at some of the links in that in that uh, one page, you'll see government reports that talk about that. Um, and we also found out there really wasn't viable solutions out there. The most common thing people look at is, is uh, Google. And we actually have a video which compares our solution to Google side by side and shows that actually Google doesn't even detect um, backups and trains. So, I don't want to take too much more time. I just want to give you an overview and love to answer any questions if you have some. Committee, any questions? Um, what does this application look like? I mean, is it like a map that you can see if you're traveling across town or what, what are you talking about? What what's, does an individual see? Okay, so there's a number of different ways that it's uh, implemented. Here is, oh, yes. Jeez. Uh, turn this so you can see it. Uh, sorry. So here's the here, here's the application. It shows you this is live from of uh, application in Janesville. So there's one view that gives you uh, basic information about those crossings and has notifications. So even if you have the map, uh, if you, even if you have the app off, it'll it'll make a notification sound. So you know you get a notification for email, you get a ding. Here you get a notification, it's a train, it's a train um, signal. And um, the reason we did that is because there are situations where um, kids have gone across crossings and, um, and uh, with their headphones on, not even knowing about trains. So this actually interrupts anything that you're listening to and lets you know about oncoming trains. Um, there's also a map. I don't know. Let's see if I can get this to work. I have to try. Let me shut off the background here. I'm sorry. Okay. There we go. So we might. So there's a map. Um, of Janesville and what happens when you have a train, the train will appear on there and um, at each crossing, there'll be a indicator and it'd be a green indicator if the crossing's open and it'll have a time that shows when the crossing is gonna close. If there's a crossing is blocked, the indicator is red and it'll be a time when the crossing's open. There's also an audio version of that same thing. So you don't actually be have, have to be looking at the app to understand that. And that's, that was a request from some of the uh, fighter crews that we had talked to that said, you know, we don't want to have to look at a second app. Um, we just, you know, want to know this information. So there's an audio version of this so that you have it on and it'll just give you the audio messages you can hear. Um, so there's a variety of different, like I said, variety of different ways that that's presented. We also have starting integrations with other types of cloud providers. We 
it's not likely to be on Google because we've tried it with Google and their response time is too slow. So for example, um, when, when we send information to Google, uh, it shows up about seven or eight minutes later, which <laughs> doesn't do you much good. Uh, but there are other applications that, that do have faster response. Okay, and then just to follow up, if the city wants to purchase this, then then the company, you being the company, if you're chosen, would put these detectors, would put these programs together, and then it, citizens would what have to buy the app to see it, or uh, if well, if the if the city purchases the license, then the citizens get the app for free. Okay, so then, okay, I get it. Yeah. So the, I, I think the biggest thing for us right now, uh, first off, real quickly, Director Ellenbecker, just uh, have the record reflected, Alder Burnett has joined us. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the biggest thing right now, guys, we got to stay at a high level on this. This is a little bit unusual where you have a provider uh, talking to us about a product. Obviously, we have a purchasing process uh, that would that would uh, figure out how to handle this. So if we could stay, what I would suggest at a high level of the general problem, the concept, um, rather than drilling too deep into how this particular product works, uh, just because again, we're going to have to go through a purchasing process. So if we know if this is something we want to explore, uh, maybe if we could focus on that discussion a little bit more. Director Ellenbecker. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, I assume this item was going to be referred to staff. Director Horanik had asked whether or not he should attend this meeting. And I said, nope, I don't think there'll be any discussion at this meeting. And so that is why Director Horanik has not attended this meeting. Because at this point, we have no funding source. And, um, you know, certainly, like you said, there's a procurement process if this is something that they wanted to explore. Yep. Uh, Kurt, could you just, uh, real quickly, a protocol piece, could you just give us your address uh, for the record? Sure, 11414 West Park Place, Milwaukee. You want the company address or my personal address? I don't think it really matters. Okay. We yeah. just need an address, I think. Okay, yeah, 11414 West Park Place, Milwaukee, 53224. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, any other questions for Kurt, our guest here? Alder Stoyer? Thank you, Chair. I um, just the general, uh, like a cost, uh, the, I know we didn't talk about that, but just, just to get a general idea of what something like this might cost. Yeah, so our, our list price on this is, oh, you should nope, have. can't this. talk about it? All right. Can't talk about it? All right, never mind. I think if you're going to need to do the pricing and RFP, I don't think we should be discussing pricing. Right, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Hey, Rob, go ahead. Bob. I'd like to speak. I don't have a question. Yep. Yeah, Rob, if you could set your name and address for the record. Yeah, Rob Miller, 227 South Van Buren Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, my interest here is purely as a citizen. I'm not paid by Kurt Brandt or that co his company or competitors. Um, Kurt was uh, kind enough to let me use uh, the app. I'm a beta tester on the Janesville. Um, the Janesville... Um, app and it works. I also had an opportunity uh, to speak at some length to uh, Gordon Lachance, who's the IT director of uh, Janesville, and they've had it for about approximately two years, and it's worked pretty much flawlessly, uh, even in the negative 33 Fahrenheit. <laughs> and uh, the technology is, is generic. Um, um, I'm not here advocating uh, a particular vendor. I am advocate, advocating the adoption by Green Bay of the same technology that uh, Fond du Lac has used for, I think, three years, Janesville for two years. Uh, Wisconsin Rapids has uh, purchased this. The city of Milwaukee has purchased this. Um, Kurt has a very nice outline um, of the advantages. He's got videos. He's got a article from the League of Wisconsin Municipalities uh, in which uh, an assistant police chief at uh, Milwaukee was outlining uh, his experience as a young firefighter uh, at a railroad crossing on a call. And he watched the building burn down 
uh, while waiting for a train. Um, and the problem, I, I had a written uh, uh, document that was submitted to you earlier this afternoon. The problem here is that the federal government has preempted the regulation of railroads. Now, this means that the city's ordinance has no application, the state statute has no application, and I cited the Court of Appeals case, which you're free uh, to read at your uh, convenience. So this is, a, this is generically available. If we can put these kinds of sensors on the surface of Mars, uh, we can put them on the west side of the Fox River. And, uh, you know, the, the pricing might be $15,000, $20,000. We, Alderman Stoyer and I have met with competitors who don't have a, a product um, in existence. Uh, they're at three times uh, this cost. I think it's uh, necessary to have the city once, and I think it's gone through a, a bidding process once before to no avail. This, let me remind the city council uh, that this started in February, 2022 and has uh, not progressed um, much to my personal dismay and to the dismay of people waiting at railroad crossings. So we can also adopt a similar technology with regard to our bridges. And uh, that would uh, be a great uh, advantage as well. In my documentation, I outlined the various advantages accruing to the city of Green Bay from the standpoint of economics, saving gasoline from the standpoint of the environment. We're not gonna burn as much gasoline from the standpoint of our protective services. The police department, the fire department, emergency services are going to be able to get to their uh, desired location much much faster. We're going to be using our, our protective services much more uh, efficiently. Uh, from the standpoint of tourism, people are not going to be a trap in our downtown uh, because of a, uh, of a train. There are enormous advantages. You know, Kurt has alluded to the return on investment here. The return on investment is astronomical. And it's time that the city of Green Bay adopted the same uh, technology that is uh, going forward elsewhere in the state. Thank you. I am not an expert on this, but the, but I would emphasize that the technology works. I've seen it work. I'm not paid to say that by anyone, and I'm 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 willing to entertain any questions that uh, anyone might have. Committee, any questions? Any other alders? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, entertain a motion to close the floor. I'll move. Second. We have a motion by Galvin, second by Hutchison. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Committee, what's your pleasure? Alder Stoyer, what would you like to see? Well, after talking to Director Ronick, you know, he was. Um, thinking that it would be referred back to staff, but all, or, uh, Mr. Miller did mention that we had this in the works of some sorts back in February. So I would like to kind of go back to that, see what the history is and see why it's either been held up or, or delayed for whatever reason. So um, I guess that, that would be one thing. Um, I think, you know, just from what I've read on this, I think that this would be a very important technology that the city should look at. Um, everything comes down to the downtown area and I have waited for countless trains and boats over time. So uh, we all have. So I think this is something that we should look at. As far as what I, I would like staff to definitely look at it, but you know, if there's an RFP process that's already been started, I'd, I'd like to continue that as well. I guess that would be my first first desire is to look at the RFP options. And if not, then refer it back to staff to continue. Yeah, and Director Hironic and I have had conversations about this on and off, you know, and really understanding kind of where it's, um, you know, it's, it's best direct impact exists. And, and I think, I certainly think that's more with uh, emergency responders. Um, you know, so I, I, it, to me, it makes sense, you know, that we just kind of refer this back to staff, uh, Alder Stoyer, whether it's you, me, both of us could just talk with uh, Director Hronik, um, figure out, I wasn't aware of an RFP process that had occurred. Sometimes staff obviously can do that and quite often does with, without directive from a committee. So 
Um, and so I'm just wondering, maybe we just get his take on that and just we bring it back at, uh, at a time then that's appropriate for him to gather some thoughts and information for us to, to talk about. Is that okay with you, Alder Steyer? Uh, that would be, I'd, I'd agree to that. I'd like to work okay. with you on that, yes. Sure, Alder Eckes, you have your hand raised? Uh, yes, I, I noticed that there's um, several different uh, members of the Green Bay Metro Fire Department on, and I just wondered if any of them wanna share their take on this particular app. Well, good evening, everybody. It's Chief Litton. Um, you know, I know that uh, Chief Gibbons was just here and he just left the uh, office, but uh, I know that uh, there was uh, some uh, review of these systems that was going on, you know, over the last year. Um, I think that what it got down to, the major stumbling block was um, financing, um, finances, uh, because of the cost of the system. Any further into that other than to say that, um, we're certainly willing to, to look at it further because obviously the need um, is, is evident just in the geography of our, our community, but I think it warrants a lot further discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else, Alder Eck? Um, no, that, this, that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee, entertain a motion. Motion. Uh to refer to staff. Okay, we have a motion by Galvin. Is there a second? Johnson will second that. Any further discussion? Uh, Director Ellenbecker? I guess I would just like a little clarity um, when you refer to staff, um, what exactly are you looking for? You're, you would like to understand the process of what has already occurred. Um, obviously we'd have to understand a, fi a financing mechanism um, who this would affect if it was just public safety that would be getting this app. And again, we probably would be going out for direction. If there is a funding source, that is when we would go for the full RFP. Um, so I guess I'm just looking for a little more. Um, and again, is it Director Haronic or I believe uh, Director Haronic had said whether or not that should be also maybe referred to maybe the traffic department. Um, you know, it's just an, it's an app and it's a software that not necessarily IT would have to oversee. That might be actually the actual department in which it would pertain to. <clears throat> so again, again, I just thought that, that we can definitely refer it to staff and then we can bring you a more comprehensive um, package back at a later meeting. Okay. So is there sufficient enough direction there, Director Ellen Becker? Yes. Okay. Alder Johnson, uh, Mr. Brandt wanted to raise his hand. He might have something to add if you'd like. All right, we'll have to open the floor again. Is there a motion to do that? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Galvin, a second by Hutchinson. Any discussion? Seeing none of those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Kurt, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention one thing about the funding. We're currently involved with um, the uh, Wisconsin DOT and some other the uh, regional planning commissions going after four different federal grants. Um, in some of the other areas to help pay for this. So um, when the funding discussion, um, maybe that's another thing that you could put into the follow on is the uh, look at the, the various grants and we can provide information on that if that's, that's helpful. Um, okay. Just add, just so you know, in Southeastern Wisconsin, we have the opportunity to get um, uh, local investors look, looking to put in the a uh, local match for a federal 20% match on a federal grant. And this is on a two and a half million dollar project for multiple communities. And I, I expect we could probably do the same type of thing in uh, Fox Valley um, where a local match would be taken care of by a, a commercial entity and essentially be zero out of pocket for the municipality. But you know, I, I don't know if that works yet because they haven't succeeded, but I just wanted to put out that there's funding opportunities. Thank you. Okay, appreciate that that additional information. Anything else, folks? So the floor is open. Okay. Okay. We have a motion by Galvin to close the floor, second by Johnson. Any further discussion? Seeing none of those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. All right, we have a motion on the floor to refer this back to staff. Anything else? 
All right. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, folks, for the discussion. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, so we're back up to item number two now. Uh, for consideration of possible action of 2023-2027 capital improvement plan, since the fire seems to be the smaller uh, of, of the departments, uh, I think maybe we'll start with fire, if that's all right with everybody. All right. Now we don't. We staff doesn't have, uh, at least to my knowledge, real specific direction. Uh, maybe other than to give us just an overview of of their proposal within their five year plan. Um, any any alders on the committee or or outside of the committee that want to see anything specific or additional with this process? Okay, Chief Litton, you get to, you're the very first one then, so you kind of get to set the standard, I guess. Fair enough. I'll just go through in uh, order um, under the major capital projects um, under the general levy items. I don't know what page it's on. Diana's going to have to. I've got a printed copy here, um, so I'm not quite sure what page it is in your documentation. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Um, so I will go to um, fire. I will go to their first page. Is the font large enough or does it look okay at this point? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. So again, a lot of these projects are just at various stations around uh, around the city. Um, uh, just things that are in routine, a need of repair or replacement, starting with uh, the carpeting at station six. That's uh, probably at least uh, 15 years old in the area. Again, you know, uses 24-7, 365 days. Uh, it's just wore out uh, in areas and needs to re be replaced. Um, you'll see down below that the garage door openers for station five and six. Um, that's the actual opening devices themselves and the rails that go along with that. Um, I think we're keeping some of the garage door companies in business here in the city with the amount of maintenance and uh, funds that we throw at them on a yearly basis. These door openers are wore out. Um, and thus the request to replace them at both of those stations. Um, you'll see down here right below that, we've got the HVAC south side of station six. So there's two different systems at um, that station. The north side had work done about six years ago, I believe it was five or six years ago. Uh, and now we need to um, essentially replace some of the equipment that's on the south side of the building, which includes the community room uh, for Fireman's Park there. Um, and you'll see lot apron um, repairs and replacement at the fire department shop. That's the ramps that go in and out of uh, the shop. And that we have this problem in many of the fire stations as well, where we have these heavy vehicles that are rolling across um, you know, asphalt and concrete, where we have major settling problems. And so the ramps need to be uh, replaced, and so that's for uh, the shop where the vehicles go on a routine basis for both uh, routine maintenance and uh, emergency repairs. Um, item right below that is the solar array array for station four. Um, so station four at one point was I think there was a grant available to put solar panels on there to help um, with the uh, energy costs there at station four. I think because of the condition of the of the roof at station four, we did not do it there. We actually shifted that project over to station five. Um, since then, station four's roof has been replaced. And so I'm not sure if there's any uh, funding left in the, um, uh, I don't know if that was a state or federal grant that came through on uh, the solar panels, but that's an, an amount I think to supplement what was being requested. The uh, item right below that is the um, major uh, item in, the, in this group is the replacement of station alerting at all of the fire stations. Um, essentially, we are operating on 19, a 1950 and early 1960s system. I won't even call it technology because that's not what it is. Um, essentially, this is um, the way that um, our stations receive the alerting or the the uh, notification that there's an emergency that requires their response. Um, the system that we have is broken. 
Um, there are not parts available for it. And a technology, obviously, from you know the last 60 years has, has uh, improved dramatically to the, the point of being able to uh, turn on and off uh, red lights outside the stations to shutting off gas valves on the stoves when the station's alerted in case they're cooking and they were to forget about that, to lighting their path with the red lights, um, to ramping up the tones because there's a quite a big, uh, a lot of uh, studies done on the fact that the sudden jolts that our systems currently give to our firefighters uh, is not healthy for their heart um, and nor their brain. Um, so there's a lot of research on all of that. So that's basically a rebuild of all of the stations uh, and the station alerting uh, that goes along with that. And then right below that, um, the windows of station seven, we've kicked that can down the road here quite a bit. And we actually, at one point, I think the bid on the, on the station was about 20,000. Um, but given that we kicked it down the road about four or five years, that's the price that we recently just got for replacing the windows of station seven, which uh, are in terrible disrepair. Um, with a lot of rotting and um, it's not possible to keep caulking them because there's no places to caulk them anymore. So um, that's the amount to replace the station, the uh, windows throughout station seven. Okay, committee, do we have questions? Maybe, Chief, if I could just put you on hold for, for one moment here, and I'm going to actually go back to Director Ellen Becker. Maybe we could have set the stage on this um, a little bit. I mean, I think the intent is that we're going to go through fire, we're going to go through DPW and their various divisions uh, today just to get a, uh, so that every alder feels comfortable that they know what's being asked of us. Uh, and then, and then uh, so two weeks from now, we're going to have another meeting. We're going to go through the other departments uh, but then, uh, Director Ellen Becker, from a process perspective, um, are we trying to shift the timing of when we make our bond requests to coincide with the budget process? Are we trying to do that this cycle? Um, yes, there has been an intentional change to try to get our capital improvement plan to kind of go along in parallel with the, the 2023 budget or to the, with the budget process. Um, so it's not going to move or shift the request up earlier. It's just going to, so you can see, this is meant to, so that you can see all the needs um, for the city and then decide whether or not anything um, is, um, is required and should be added to our 2023 budget, our next year's budget. Um, most, most municipalities have their CIPs actually approved about the same time in unison, like I said, with their budget. So that is our goal. Um, so we are trying to move these forward together so we understand all the needs of the city. Um, and again, what can we afford in the budget? What can we afford in the next year's bonding? Um, I think that, you know, I had this discussion with other alders. Um, you know, the request in total is about 19 million um, for general levy for the first year, for the, like, uh, for 2023. Um, in the past, historically, we have said we, were we would try to not borrow more than we pay off, but obviously the things we're paying off are bonds from 20 years ago. So as cost goes up, you know, what, um, you know, there's a chance, you know, your odds are your, your, your requests are going to go up. Um, but what that means is um, you are going to see over the next, you know, every year as you borrow more than what you pay off, you are going to see more um, debt service required in the annual budget. Um, so a lot a, a more money is needed from the, again, the annual levy to help pay for debt service. So again, we're trying to move these two uh, processes forward. Um, again, what you're seeing in front of you is these are all of the needs that the departments, um, department heads have asked for, needs or wants, um, you know, and, and they, they, obviously their needs um, that we need to um, consider. And then whether or not, um, if, we, if they can't all be um, fulfilled in 2023, um, can they be delayed? Can they be changed? Can, they, can we find efficiencies? Can we find another funding source for these um, items? So again, the list is in front of you. This is, was put in together at a point in time about a month ago. Um, obviously, this is a um, evolving document. So there's probably something that maybe now should have come off the document. There's probably two more things that maybe need to get added to the document. But this is a, a point in time when we pulled it together. Yeah, and one thing that that at least seems missing to me, unless I'm misunderstanding something about this process, is we made some commitments, uh, some future commitments on, on purchasing new fire engines that I don't see on here. 
Um, yes, this book was actually finalized before we, uh, I believe before that was um, approved. Th those, both of those um, fire um, engines are on the list there. I think they were maybe in 23 and 25 or 24 and 25, um, but the price has gone up what we committed. We also committed to, to get, um, get um, garbage, garbage refuse trucks, which are also on here, but you're right. Um, I did say I would add a note on them that these haven't been already obligated, but this book was um, uh, pulled together. This is the third time that we put it on the packet. So that is, um, it's been a month and a half ago that this um, book was pulled together. Um, and then the third item that we also talked about, um, and um, we also have the fire station where we allocated ARPA dollars, or not for the fire, well, for the fire station, the first phase of really of a fire station replacement, that million dollars of ARPA, that also should be put on here because it is a capital item, just the funding source would be ARPA. Um, so again, part of this is this book was pulled together um, almost a month and a half ago. And so um, we, those items haven't been updated. It was, I didn't want to make changes from, so every time you looked at it, you would see different, a different document. And that is something we certainly can do. We can make updates between now and the next meeting, or we, um, I just, again, I didn't want to make changes and have this change every time you looked at it. Yeah. And so the fire engines, are they like under the, because I don't have, I, you know, this thing's 700 pages long. So yep. like, are they, are they under the, uh, the fleet section? Yep. Yes. Correct. Okay. There's three sections. This whole book is broken into three sections. There's the major section, there's the equipment section, and there's a fleet section. So there actually is a some summary page of um, of each one of the sections of what's included, like what we're seeing here now. This is all the major. You're going to see it by departments. And again, we have one for equipment and fleet. So um, whenever you're ready, we can move on to the fire equipment requests, and then we'd have the fleet requests. Do you want to talk equipment for fire or would you like to jump to the fleet? So elect if you if you have the electronic document in front of you, um, it is actually on page 381, the summary pages uh, that starts for the equipment and then fleet starts on page 500. Um, I think Alder Johnson is locked up. Oh. I think it makes sense just to go to equipment just because that's the way it is in the report and then go to fleet. Can I have a, ask a question first? Yes. I don't, okay. Um, well, going back to the previous document you had up, um, obviously, and you did allude to it um, uh, regarding the ARPA funds for the fire stations. So I, I see there's quite a few items on here for stations one and three and um, I mean, obviously, I know you're you're saying you don't want to keep changing the document, but um, the those items that are being budgeted now would then they go towards the new buildings? If if say because um, I mean these are a couple years out, so uh, going. Oh, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, you, do you get what I'm saying? You know, they're on here, but hopefully they won't be needed because there'll be a new building by, um, say, your HVAC for stations one and three, um, you know, a couple of years from now. Yes, I would expect, I would expect as if we, as we move forward, um, as we add this uh, item for um, for the fire station consolidation, um, those, those two stations that those items then would come off because they're really, um, they were on here assuming that, I'm sorry, let me let Alder Johnson back in. Okay. Um, yeah, there would be an assumption that if, if they are, the fire station one and three are going to be new, these um, other items would come off. They're on here only because there wasn't that discussion hadn't been, hadn't been had earlier. And if that they aren't replaced, these are items that they're saying that they're going to need in the future years. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, guys. My system crashed, but I'm back. Good. Uh, okay, because I'm jumping in. It sounds like somebody asked a question, got an answer. <laughs> I can real, real. Um, um, Alder Eck just asked about there's some fire station one and three on this list. If we were to move forward with uh, potentially a replacement of fire station one and three, would those items be added to the item? 
them or with the list? And I said, I think they'd come off the list because those are items that it was the, uh, with the assumption that we were not going to replace them. These are items that would have to be replaced at this point. If that item moves forward, we add that ARP item, those one in three um, items could come off of this list. No, um, because really at this point, I think the million dollars is to look for what the next steps are and, and find the phasing um, of four stations, one and three. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Any other questions on this? About, section? Um, just also, yeah, we talked about jumping to equipment for fire and then jumping to um, fleet after that um, for fire. So they could talk about the remaining items. So if you're following along in the electronic document, page 381 is the start of the recap of all the equipment by department. And then, as you know, all the detail pages be, are behind that. Um, so we have some, um, we'll jump down to the police. Here's the fire's um, equipment requests. Okay, so again, uh, under our equipment requests, you'll see the very first item there is a base station, uh, radio is station eight. Again, it's old and antiquated equipment. Um, we are responsible re for replacing that equipment uh, at station eight, $17,900. And again, those base stations usually have a shelf life of somewhere in the area of 15 years. Sometimes we get 20. I think this particular one is right at the 20 year mark. Um, then below that, you've got gear washer and dryers for both station four and station six. It essentially is a high G-force um, washer extractor that is required at every single station. Every time our, uh, any of our firefighters go into a fire, uh, car fire, uh, structure fire, vegetation fire for that matter, um, the smoke and the toxins that come off of the fire is car carcinogenic. And so they are required to wash their gear every single time in that instance. That's why we have a primary set of turnout gear and then a, a, a backup or secondary set of gear for them. So that when they're washing their primary, they have a secondary to jump into. So those are replacing um, units out there that are in uh, bad shape, bad disrepair, uh, and it's just time for them to be replaced. Um, right below that, the hazmat mass uh, spectatron, I guess is what I'll call that. Um, essentially, that is a machine that identifies any unknown substance uh, within seconds. Um, why is that important? Well, if we have any kind of incident anywhere in the city where we have an unknown spill of any sort, um, our hazmat team uses this machine to identify. Give you, um, a, for instance, at Lambeau Field, we may or may not have people that throw um, their loved ones onto the field, their ashes. And so every time that happens, Obviously, it's an unknown. We must test that immediately uh, to know whether or not we have to clear the field and whether or not we have to clear the stands. And so um, the, that piece of equipment is extremely, extremely important given our uh, position in the world, so to speak, uh, and with the number of special events uh, that we have in the community. Um, again, that machine that we have is uh, outdated. There are no longer any parts for the ones that we have, and it um, we are seeing failures with it at this point. So going down right below that, you'll see turnout gear. I would point out that this is an area that that item of 133403. As of right now, we do have the turnout gear in the GO, uh, the general operating uh, budget request. So if it stays in the GO request, um, then we'll take this out of this uh, out of this uh, request here in the, in the CIP. It's been kind of flipping back and forth every year, kind of whether we have funds or don't have funds. Um, it is uh, the finance department's position and really my position that it should be kept in the general operating fund, not in our CIP. So that is a potential for that to come out based on what our discussions are with the uh, GEO fund. Yep, I'll just jump in. Yeah, correct. That is really not a capital item in your rate. Over a few years back, we started putting it in capital. We're bonding for it. It's really an operational item. And so we really wanted to move it and it's back into the operating budget. Um, the only other note I wanted to mention is um, I'll, um, Chief is talking about the column 2023. And that is the one that most in need immediate, whether or not that should go in your 2023 budget or if these are things that we would want to consider for 2023 borrowing or bonding um, going forward. Um, but really the whole all five years really should be somewhat reviewed um, because this book 
you know, if these items are in there in 2022 20, forward 25, the assumption is they're just going to keep rolling and moving forward. So, um, you know, it's it's at least the, it, the department has warned us and showed that these are needs that the future needs that are um, are coming. So I just wanted to bring, bring it to your attention. I know we're only really looking at 23, and that's what the chief is talking about. But you know, any of these items are you know really up for questions and really is in this book as future needs. And on that, I could also, I'm gonna to jump to now the fleet page that if you're on the electronic book, it is page 500 of the book. Um, that, that there is a recap of um, all the fleet that is being asked for over the next five years. And I will move down to the fire department. So um, um, yeah, you'll see there Alder Johnson, you were asking about the uh, ladder trucks that we pre-ordered. Diana's highlighting them there right now. So that's in the 2024 bonding of uh, one one point one million six hundred ninety five thousand each, uh, so that's in next year's um, bonding and being shown there. But Director Lambecker, can we for those couple of decisions we made uh, this one and the, the the refuse trucks? I think can we like color code those so that it stands out that hey these are these are obligated. Um, I will look into color coding. Um, these are reports right out of the system, but I will find some way maybe to identify for sure. Um, I will work with our programmer and see what we can do. Okay, thank you. So going back to our 2023 request, you'll see uh, one ambulance up there, ambulance seven. Um, that number might be a little bit high. They've been coming in a little bit lower than that, but we're a little, we are a little concerned with what's going on with supply chain issues and with the, the kind of increases we've been seeing. We've already seen them in the ladder trucks that we talked about uh, several weeks ago about the, how that cost has jumped. Um, but I, what I will say about the ambulances is, uh, is this, um, once we get uh, ambulance seven, uh, when, once that one comes in, we will have turned our fleet all over from uh, van style chassis uh, over to truck style chassis. And we did that uh, with a purpose. And number one, the van chassis were breaking down pretty regularly and routinely, and they were not built for the kind of uh, beating that we put on them here in the city. Uh, number two, the vans were never uh, four by four equipped. And obviously here in the city with the winter weather that we have, we needed to have four by four um, ambulances to get, get them around the city. There was literally times where we were pulling the ambulances around town with, with a fire engine and, and so forth. And we'd get stuck and have to dig them out. And of course that delays our response. And that's obviously not a good situation. Having said all of that, um, we've had the ambulances on a four year rotation, meaning that we've re been replacing them every four years. Um, going forward after 2023, this coming year, um, we're going to a five-year rotation on them because of the truck chassis with the ultimate eye of getting to a six-year rotation. So I think that you'll start seeing these ambulances spaced out over time now, um, depending on where they're located. Now, Station 2 and Station 6 are our busiest stations. Those might have to stay on a, on a five-year rotation, but I think all the rest of them at this point uh, going forward, you'll start seeing those on a six-year rotation, which obviously will save have some uh, some cost savings for uh, taxpayers going forward just because of the the nature of the vehicle the heavier duty build on them and and, and I, quite honestly we may get seven years out of them but i don't want to promise that at this point uh though next year at this time i'll be sitting on my deck in tennessee so you, you have to call me and complain down there anyway um moving down the line um, chief real quickly uh, since you're on the ambulances are those staggered yes yeah they're all if you look across there so you'll see in 20 uh, 25, I think it is the third column over, you'll see med, med two. And then if you see in 2026, you'll see med six and med eight, and then the following year, three and five. So, um, I, right now that those are set up on a four-year stagger, you'll see some adjustment in this, uh, in the CIP document. Um, once we get past this season, like Diana said, if we keep changing them every single time, you're going to see a different number every time you look at this. So after we get through this, this CIP request, you'll see us push uh, some of those will get staggered out uh, down the line, a little further out. Yeah, and I guess when I'm looking at them and I'm just you know posing a hypothetical here, but if I'm counting this right, I see seven ambulances. And, and if, you know, if you've got that seven years as an example, right? For instead of bonding for any of these, it would be nice if we could just buy one every year through the levy and then stop paying interest on this kind of stuff. So again, okay. not necessarily looking to translate this to, so much as it is to make a broader point about how we look at the entire CIP. 
Yeah, and I would just tell you that if you look at the, the revenue stream that the fire department generates, um, this year, I think we're gonna end up at about $4 million and uh, just ambulance billing itself. One year, $4 million, that's what we collect. So when you start looking at, you know, what the costs are here as far as capital things in, this, in, the, in the fire department, much of that is picked up, you know, through generating money through uh, number one, uh, the ambulance billing. So, and I think that there's a, I've, I've shared this with the mayor and I've shared, shared this with Diana as well. Um, state law just changed this year. Um, they're still, we're still waiting on the Department of Health Services to write the final rules, but there's something out there called ground emergency medical transport bill. It's a federal legislation that basically the state had to take advantage of. Uh, and because of that, I believe starting in 2024, you're going to see an additional million dollars roughly in uh, revenue line and the uh, ambulance billing. So um, there's some good news coming on that down the road here. And, that's, and I really, what you just said, I think makes a lot of sense would be to you know, start picking these off, you know, use the revenue to pay for some of these things uh, as they, you know, are, are needing a replacement. And the only the three things we have on there, if you if Dinah scrolls down, we have three staff vehicles that need to be replaced. Um, and the numbers on there are something, we don't know exactly what those vehicles are going to look like, but understand when we put a number in there that that includes buying the vehicle, um, making sure that they're identified. So in other words, the the uh, lettering and the, and the striping and so forth. And then we've got to put emergency lighting on them and, and all the ancillary equipment that goes along with them. So those three staff vehicles are cumulatively, I think the newest one there is probably 12 years old and you from 12 to 14 years old and they are uh, in pretty rough shape. So we actually delayed the, re the, uh, the uh, replacement of uh, the three chief vehicles, uh, myself and the two assistant chiefs. We pushed those back because our vehicles are in good shape still. So we pushed them back and I imagine that they'll get pushed back several years after this. So uh, these training vehicles are the ones that are absolutely necessary at this point. And I think that covers all of our requests for this year anyway. Okay. Committee, do we have any questions on the fleet? No. Okay. Uh, Chief, up to you if you want to stay on the line. My, my hunch is we're not taking any action tonight. Um, uh, but if there are no further questions on uh, fire, uh, fire department, uh, we'll move on to DPW. Okay. Um, ours is actually, although long, very easy. <clears throat> what you're seeing here is a combination of road projects and bridge projects. The road projects are intended to achieve a goal of roughly 1.6% of our local street mileage per year. Uh, and then the bridge program uh, is reflective of uh, situations with the 30 plus bridges that the city currently owns. So with that in mind, uh, as Chief Litton had identified to you uh, in his conversation, three of the items that you see in the 2023 bond request, the annual bridge inspections, annual bridge maintenance, concrete crack repair, and the $10,000 for the deck ceiling, at the request of finance department, we have removed that $205,000 from our bond request and placed it into our operating budget. So you'll be seeing those items as part of the operating budget. But so one question I had for you, Steve. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said, that was the one question I had for you. So you oh. beat me to it already. Okay. Yeah, that, that was a suggestion from finance because it is annual maintenance. It's truly maintenance. Um, historically, we had paid for that out of our bonded funds, but it does make sense uh, to utilize our operating budget instead. Um, so with that, if Diana just wants to, to scroll down uh, to take a look at what projects we are proposing for next year um, and whether the committee has any questions regarding uh, our major capital program. Are, are all of these being engineered already, Steve? No. So really you're, I mean, because I know the engineering cycle takes a little bit of time. So pretty yep. much you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're waiting to see the decision that, that we make and then you'll, you'll start the engineering process. 
some of the projects are in engineering already. Um, we take a little bit of a gamble, but the the four projects that were delayed out of the 2021 or 2022 capital program over on the near uh, southwest side, we do anticipate those going forward in, they would take priority in the 23. Uh, so we are going ahead with the design on those. And we are working on the, the annual street resurfacing program. While the program itself may, may not be as large as what we have proposed, uh, if the council were to ask for a reduction in cost, um, it doesn't hurt to have those streets designed and then the design place on the shelf. And that was ultimately why I was asking. I wanted to know if there would be a fiscal impact if if we said, you know what, Steve, you're asking for X amount, we're gonna reduce that. I, I you know, I'm trying to determine if there is uh, an additional fiscal impact from designs becoming essentially outdated. Knowing it early in the year prior to construction is definitely going to be helpful. That did trip us up uh, in 22 because we had the bond uh, discussion and approval of the capital program in, I think, March. Um, and some of those streets had been uh, were in the design process. So for in order to get back on the streets that were ultimately approved for the 22 program, there was some wasted time there. Uh, and we're trying to avoid that, but uh, I, I don't I don't see that happening this year because we're going to know before the the end of the fiscal the end of this year, um, which will help us plan our design going into early next year a little bit better. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We got a question on the main street over Fox River, the uh, one point one million. Yes. Um, is this a reoccurring cost? Is it maintenance uh, or is it fixing an issue or what is that? We are replace we're replacing the entire hydraulic uh, electro hydraulic system that runs that bridge. Okay. The electro hydraulic system is over 25 years old. Um, probably 10 years ago, a little bit more. Uh, during a routine inspection of the hydraulic system, we noticed brass, bronze, bronze flakes in the hydraulic fluid, metallic shavings. Uh, and their investigation led to a problem with some of the pumps uh, because that's a closed loop system that hydraulic fluid gets pumped out of the pump through the hydraulic motor. There's a lot of moving pieces, let's put it that way. So there were some concerns that there are four, do, uh, four repetitive systems, two on the east side, two on the west side, but they're, for all intents and purposes, they're virtually identical. If one of them failed, the probability was pretty good that all four of them were living on borrowed time. So we've been, we've been trying to get this project into the, into the program for more than three years. Um, but it's extremely expensive. So what we did is staff broke it down into more manageable chunks uh, with the hope that we can get some reimbursement from uh, Wisconsin DOT through the local lift bridge uh, uh, funding. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and in Steve's defense, I, you know, I specifically recall us delaying this, you know, th those items the last couple of years and hoping that some of the federal legislation that was coming down, you know, could potentially be tapped into. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of reaffirm what Steve said that that we have made that decision. Uh, it's it's at some point we're gonna kind of have to have that that moment of of you know decision. So yeah. Okay, Alder Burnett. Yeah, <clears throat> Director Grenier, <clears throat> earlier in the summer, I think July, a bunch of my neighbors uh, received letters that the streets out here were being considered for, uh, I think the wording was uh, preliminarily selected your street to be included, to be reconstructed in 2023. 
that would be like sumac, sequoia, shake bark, seminole, you know, that, that whole cluster of streets. I don't see them on this list unless I'm overlooking some. The, I, if I had to guess, those streets don't sound like reconstructs. It sounds like they have been tentatively identified for the resurfacing program. Oh, there, there. It's reconstruction. It says right on the letter, and uh, it would be a sewer and street water main. That's the first time I've heard of those streets coming up. Okay. Yeah, you might want to. Uh, it was a letter sent out by uh, Assistant Director Burnett, uh, July eleventh. You might want to just touch base with them. And I'm just going to, full disclosure, I, I received two letters because it is my street. And I did not know that these were being considered either. So I was surprised, just like my neighbors, pleasantly surprised. So I just want that to be known. So I'm not trying to pull any favors or anything, but just if you could look into that, that would be great. Now, would maybe just say Director Ellen Becker, as, as we talked about maybe getting this slightly tweaked and updated, uh, if, if in fact there's something there, maybe just take note that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 Alder Burnett, I'm looking at, there must have been a typo in the letter. I'm looking at the preliminary list of resurfacing streets for 2023. Aya, Seminole, Shagbark, Seneca, Sumac, Trillium all appear on that list. Okay. <clears throat> so it was for resurfacing. Okay. So are they still, so they're not on this list here, but do you think that those are all scheduled to be resurfaced? They are on the, on the draft list of resurfacing. And one of the things we weren't able to get it done um, for this meeting but at the top of the screen here, uh, the second line down, you can see the resurfacing program at about $2.6 million per year. Okay. All right. What we're going to do is go into the detail sheet that supports every one of these requests. And in the notes, we'll put the list of candidate streets uh, that are in each. So that way we've got that. It's tied in. Now, to jo Alderman Johnson's point, <laughs> Some time ago, it's a 700 page document. It's, you're still gonna have to look for it a little bit, but it will actually be in there. Okay, fair enough, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Director Grenier, one, one just, and I don't know if this would be a Scribner's error or if it's, maybe it's not, and then you guys interpret it differently, but I look at like South Maple, um, uh, South Maple app and uh, Kellogg to Mather. Uh, Kellogg to Mather is actually North Maple. Um, and, and same with uh, Walnut to Kellogg, that would be North Maple. Uh, Mather you know, to Phoebe, Walnut. right. And I bring that up because uh, originally it was, you know, it, it, it changes the alphabet, uh, the alphabetical order. So if someone's looking for that street, they won't find it. Point taken. We'll get that fixed. Because I, I was able to tell some folks in my district that, hey, you, you weren't on this plan, but then I saw it was listed as South Maple. I said, wait a minute, you are on the plan. So they were pretty happy too. <laughs> okay, we'll get that fixed. So then here you'll see traffic signal repair. Uh, we typically try to do upgrades on two signalized intersections per year. Uh, there are... 101 signalized intersections across the city of Green Bay. So that's to try to get um, outdated technology uh, running those signals out, make upgrades to allow for bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Uh, so this will also go along with the safe routes to schools and the safe walk and bike plan that the city adopted. Uh, so in order to do that, we need to change the controller cabinets the programmable logic controllers uh, and a lot of the wiring signal uh, standards and the actual section heads on the on, on the uh, the signals. <clears throat> uh, Director Grenier, just looking at the sidewalk 
program before Director Ellen Becker scrolls past it. Yep. Uh, is that maintaining what we've allocated in the past or is that an increase? That is maintaining. Alder Galvin, <laughs> you've brought this issue up. So I just want to give you an opportunity to pontificate on it. Well, sure. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, Steve put, toge put together a, a program to um, try and get the city sidewalks up to code, uh, but they're not funding it. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, and that's been the problem all along. Um, uh, the money that is allocated for sidewalks is, could be all used up in one project. And, and that's what's been happening. We started out like gangbusters when we did an area on the east side and west side that virtually have no sidewalks. Then when we start getting down towards the center of the city where there's much more sidewalks, uh, the, the, the funding, you know, obviously there's nothing there. So it's not gonna get done. And, um, you know, I've talked uh, to the mayor about this and, uh, you know, I mean, where, where do we get the money from? Alder Galvin, were you able to learn anything about the Improvement Service Committee meeting two weeks ago? The reason I ask, um, during the director's report, I had a informed, and that's one of the knocks on the civic clerk um, minutes that we do now. Um, if they're informational items, those aren't reported in civic clerk. So the directors, the contents of the director's report aren't necessarily in the minutes. Um, but one of the things that I identi identified to the committee, we recently met with a company here in Wisconsin by the, uh, that's, the name is Safe Step. Um, and they are, a, they are a professional service provider. Not only do they do the horizontal cutting it, it's actually a horizontal cut, not a grind, uh, to remove the trip hazards, but they actually also do evaluation. So we gave them our criteria <clears throat> and they can go out and evaluate the sidewalk for defect, identify what type of defect it is. If it's not a defect that they can correct, they tabulate all those so we know what we have to put into a future sidewalk bid. But if it's a trip hazard that could simply be sawn off and remove that hazard, they can fix that on the fly. So what I've done is I've authorized them. I signed it last week. Uh, we are doing a $15,000 pilot program to see how much of the defects. We, we strongly believe from our experience that many of the defects that require sidewalk improvement um, are due to trip hazard, heaved sidewalk. So if we can alleviate 90% of the issues with the sidewalk for 40% of the cost, that will help us go further with the money we have. So we are running a pilot project and we were looking for a location that was heavily covered tree canopy, narrow terraces, older sidewalks that just so happens to be about a half mile of sidewalk in the vicinity of uh, Astor Park. So you are winding up as the primary beneficiary of the pilot project. So that, that is going on as we speak. Well, I, I appreciate that uh, because I, and, and, I, and I think sometimes the city has a um, take it all down type of thing to fix sidewalks. Uh, I had a constituent that had a corner lot and he wanted his sidewalks done. Uh, the city came back and um, took care of the or pointed out the uh, segments that they were responsible for leaving him with a um, $5,000 potential bill to replace all the sidewalks. Um, after talking to the city and then having the city contact him back, he was able to do a lot of the repair work himself merely by using a compound to fill holes, uh, mud jacking, that kind of stuff. And he reduced that bill from $5,000 to $2,000. I'm just wondering, does the city do this also? Or, or are they just, if it's hit it and old, they just replace it all? Um, we Again, the sidewalk program is probably one of the most misunderstood programs we have. 
that is not a city responsibility. It's actually the responsibility of the property owner to correct those defects. I, I understand. I'm, I'm talking about the city's responsibility. Where, where so, the city has responsibility, that's what I'm asking. On, on sidewalk that the city is responsible for? Yes. Okay. With that, we have not had the ability to competitively bid something other than a remove and replace. There's not enough vendors out there that have alternate technology. So by bringing in a company who can also do the evals, now it becomes a professional service as opposed to um, a bid task. Changes the bidding requirements a little bit. So we're doing this pilot study and the reason for the pilot study is we wanna see how it turns out to see if there's a way that we could expand that and that will definitely, because almost all of the city responsibility sidewalks are do, heaving due to trees, 90% of them. True. So there again, we're looking to see, can we get the largest number with the least amount of impact, the least amount of effort, um, saving those tougher ones for the more expensive treatments. So is, is the idea to start funding more money into these programs so we can get more sidewalks done eventually? I mean, at the rate we're going, had we had the proper funding, it would have been 15 years to get our sidewalks up to code. At the rate we're going, um, none of us will be alive by the time our sidewalks are all up to code. Well, there's a lot more going on than the money when it comes to that. Um, We've got two sidewalk contractors out there trying to get sidewalks replaced right now, and they can't because they are on quotas for the amount of concrete that they're getting from the concrete plants. Some of our contractors are literally getting one truck a day. That's all they're allocated. Which to me sounds idiotic. The largest Portland cement plant in the world is in Alpena, Michigan. That stuff is loaded onto a barge and shipped here in the Green Bay to the Lafarge Terminal on the west side. There shouldn't be supply chain issues. There really shouldn't. You're, you're not dealing with trucking. You're not dealing with rail. Um, I don't know if it's a situation where they can't get people to work at the plant. <clears throat> if there's no sailors in the Merchant Marine on the lakes, I, I don't know. but we've been told there is a severe shortage with uh, Wisconsin DOT in the Southeast region, you have to plan bridge pours three weeks in advance. And if you miss your window, if something happens to put you behind where you can't get the concrete delivered on that day, you go to the, <clears throat> excuse me, you go to the end of the line, you wait three weeks again. So we could have thrown money at it hand over fist. It wasn't going to help us because we can't get the concrete right now. Okay, but when we can get the concrete, can we throw money at it hand over fist? We can see. All right, thank you. Okay, now we get into our building repairs. So the building repairs for next year are actually relatively minor. Um, so we got electrical over at our lower lane facility, that's for sanitation. Um, exit lighting, emergency lighting at the West Shop. Uh, some window replacements. Uh, we've got some windows over there that are in excess of 60 years old. Uh, and then some facade imp uh, improvements because we have weather getting behind the facade uh, causing damage to the building itself. So that is a pretty good synopsis of the 23 ask. Um, Director Ellen Becker, just a quick question. Do we, do we have a policy at all in place? Um, you know, I'm looking at like the $5,000 electrical repair. Um, I'm just curious if there's like a, a policy in place that determines when things get bonded. Is there a certain limit um, that we have to meet or is it just kind of like an aggregate request to address all these concerns? Um, our capital policy would say um, typically anything over $5,000 and it should help extend the life of the um, if it was a repair, it should extend the life. This one would probably be something we would consider, but it should be maybe operational. Um, but um, 
we do we did we actually just worked with the um, Department of Public Works and our auditors this past year to put a capital policy in place and actually we just talked about it today that we were going to make sure our policy was in the beginning when we uh, finalize and pull up pull up the final a final capital um, improvement book together um, uh, but really bottom line is it's usually 5,000 and it should extend the life or it should have a useful life of more than a couple years. So what we have here is the 5,000 for the electrical at Lore, the 35,000 uh, for the exit lighting, the $75,000 on the window replacement, and the 650,000 for the exterior facade improvements, which is a grand total of 765,000 in a larger West Side garage building repair contract. Yeah, and that, that, that's kind of why I, sort of post it, Steve, with like, uh, you know, making the request in aggregate. Well, and we can definitely do that, Alder. What we were trying to do is show you what made up that 765. But similarly, uh, what we could do is make the aggregate request. And then in the notes, like I was alluding to uh, with the resurfacing, put the individual projects uh, into the notes section. So you've got that breakout. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of our major capital. Then 382, Diana is. Yep. How does that total, Steve, like we're looking at 15.1 million, how does that align with what we've done in the past? It's definitely, it, it's a little higher than, than some years. Uh, but in line with others, um, this, the program we're dealing with here, um, shows the total dollar value of some of these projects, not necessarily how we're funding it. Right. So with a, um, Yeah, I just jumped to the funding page and I was just going to jump in there and say those are your full expenses and if there is another funding source, there is the summary on the back of the page. And so most of these items on the top are really items that would have come from DPW's um, section. So they are expecting about $1.2 million in assessment. Around about they're expecting about a half a million from Brown County. Um, then we have the general levy borrowing. Um, this this is where typically um, Director Grenier sometimes has additional dollars that are left over from previous bonding that he then then applies toward his expenses and then helps bring the bond down. He has some state aid. He has some TIF funding that's going to help um, fund some of the pro road projects. He also has um, an estimated amount of m money coming in from wheel tax. So, you know, between these, there is potentially already six million dollars worth of um, that is. Um, but different funding sources that will help pay for some of these items that um, Director Grenier has just talked about. So by way of comparison, <clears throat> our pavement and bridge program has a total aggregate value of about 14.4 million. But of that, we are requesting $8.7 million in levy supported borrowing. So we have you know, almost $6 million in other funding that we're able to bring, bring forward. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so Diana had the equipment there. Uh, brush cutter is uh, that that's actually something that fits on the front of a tool cat uh, for doing lot cleanups, uh, uh, industrial floor scrubber for the West Side garage, hydraulic room for a tool cat, pallet forks for a loader, uh, a tilt bed trailer that's for transporting things like tool cats across the city. Uh, if you Except for after nine o'clock at night, if you ever see a traffic signal that goes into conflict flash and it's red on all four sides, um, the traffic signal conflict monitor that helps us diagnose um, what is going wrong, what type of issues we have in the tra traffic signal controller. As the traffic signal controllers, the PLCs advance in technology, the old conflict monitors become outdated. Um, we have an air compressor that is failing that we need to get replaced. Uh, and then one of our zero turn mowers is at the end of its useful life.
Any discussion on when we look at some of these items and, and look, I, I, you know, I'm financially savvy enough to understand that we can't absorb everything into our operational budget overnight. Um, you know, but any discussion about whether or not some of those things could qualify for operational budget? Um, I think they could. And I think what you're going to see is what um, one of the mar largest changes that we made for 2023 budget is we did try to, we added the body cams for um, police, which is over $550,000. We took that out. We currently have it in the 2023 proposed budget. Um, so as we took 200,000 from um, DPW, and then two years ago, we took about 150,000 from fire for their turnout gear. And when I say DPW, we just talked about the annual bridge maintenance and we've taken some small police and um, uh, police um, expenses. Um, now we also, this year, we also tried moving the $500,000 of body cam. So you're right, um, we, are, we are intentionally moving some forward. And so again, that is the whole point of bringing the CIP together with the operating budget. When you see your operating budget, you may say at some point going, well, we can't move that much out of CIP. We need to move more back into the CIP. Or you always have the other option of saying, maybe there's room for another 100,000. Maybe you could take off you know, six, 10 items out of the CIP. So we did intentionally move the um, body cams out of bonding. Um, we previously bonded one year and then second year we paid for ARPA. So third year is coming around. We move that to operating. If it stays, then we won't have to be bonding for the body cams. Okay, thank you. We'll jump to fleet. Please. Now, this is one of the items that I was alluding to before. We've got, uh, there's an enterprise system where we're leasing a lot of our smaller passenger vehicles. That's showing here in the document at 227, 175. But Diana, could you go to page 655, please? As we scroll down, the funding source, it's not coming out of levy supported borrowing. So it's showing in the fleet replacement program so for transparency, but it has no impact on borrowing. So we just wanna make you aware of that. And Steve, that is with leases, I guess we haven't been very consistent in the CIP. We are now have four departments that are leasing some vehicles. And I think in most other cases, we have now removed them from the CIP. We thought maybe we'd have a separate page or really all the, all the leases, um, we are putting the expenses in the operating side. And then we also have, <clears throat> either you're gonna have levy or you're gonna be um, offset by some, by sale of equipment. So yep. all cases um, we have now moved and that was an intentional decision by council about three years ago, four years ago to start moving to for support vehicles to go to a lease option instead of every year trying to replace a handful of support vehicles, bond for them. And our fleet overall was just getting older and older. So when we moved to the lease program, we had intended about 100 and there was 130, 140 vehicles at the time. And over a course of about four years, the plan was to replace and get um, up roughly 40 some vehicles on the lease program each year to start having um, get those vehicles that are somewhere we're already 8, 10, 12 years old and try to get them into a um, um, get up to great data fleet and then slowly again stop bonding for <laughs> and put them um, back into the operating budget. So um, to Steve's point, yours is in here, but I don't think police inspections or parks actually have them on this um, in this program. So um, to his point, this will, would not be bonded for. So again, going down, uh, second line under DPW, the automated refuse truck. Uh, again, that's what Alder Johnson was talking about earlier that we've already committed on. Uh, but for this year, we are looking at two refuse collection vehicles, a sidewalk tractor, uh, another sidewalk tractor with attachments, um, then a tandem, uh, tandem axle dump truck with a wing and plow. I 
that really takes care of DPW's major equipment and fleet. Don't know if any more questions on the DPW side. Yeah, um, just a, a quick question. I see the lease vehicle payments. It, is that a request to bond to make the lease payments? What is that? Oh, that's exactly what we were just talking about. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, Never that mind then. That really in, could be, that could be removed from this document as that it, it will be in the operating budget. This would not be in bonded. We have either it is either going to be levy or it's going to be offset. The two revenue sources will be either levy or sale of equipment. Okay, got it. I, I didn't connect the dots that that's what was being discussed. Okay. Yes. I got ahead of myself looking at other numbers. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, that would be the DPW is um, again major equipment and fleet. And those would be levy supported items if we move forward, either move them into operation or if the or if we were to bond for these in future years. Um, what Steve would also be talking about is sanitary storm and parking are also on this document. And those would not be levy supported. They would be um, funding their own programs. I will go back to major. So again, the sanitary sewer program, uh, this is largely in support of either the resurfacing or reconstruct streets uh, with the exception of the chronic sewer repairs citywide. Uh, that is a program where we go through on the sanitary side and we televise basin by basin around the city. And as we identify uh, sewers that are in need of uh, repair or replacement that are not associated with a street reconstruction program. That's what that program, uh, the million dollars is for there. So that's an annual necessity, right? Yes. And what and we've done is we've started with the oldest parts of the city. So we started at the core of downtown and then we are working our way out to the periphery. And currently, like, how long has that been in place? And are we currently bonding that? Well, it's a combination um, with the with the sanitary and storm. Um, the utility itself within their operating budget, we transfer about two million dollars out of those utilities into their capital construction funds. So part of it's bonded, part of it's um, operating funds. Sanitary sewer funds? Sanita sanitary and storm operate the same way. Oh, okay, got it, yep. Any questions, committee? Nope. Okay, and then if it pleases the committee, I think what we'll do is we'll just handle sanitary parking and storm sequentially and then jump to equipment, then jump to fleet. Yep, that works. So parking utility, uh, $650,000 for the last 10 years or better is what we've been programming to keep our ramps operational. Um, so that that has been enough. Um, I am concerned that at some point in time, um, and that point in time is not too far in the distant future, we are not gonna be able to keep up with the ramp repairs at that funding level. However, larger discussion we need to have at some point, um, Main Street ramp is our oldest ramp and our smallest ramp. As part of the developer's agreement with Shriver Foods Incorporated, um, that ramp has to come down no later than August of 2031. So if we're pushing almost a half million dollars worth of repair into a ramp that has less than nine years worth of life into it, we're not gonna see the return on investment or those types of repairs. So probably within the next two years, uh, we are going to be having, we're starting the discussions at the staff level here in parking, uh, but we're going to be bringing that up to the council level as to whether or not we want to 
cut bait and potentially put that thing on the ground quicker, but then we're going to have to fund a new ramp as well. So we currently have, we're working on an update to the 2013 parking study. And that's one of the things we're hoping to get out of that update to the 2013 parking study is uh, the viability of continuing with the main street ramp versus looking for a location and putting a new ramp downtown. Okay, going into storm sewer again, uh, the Arndt Street projects are tied to reconstructs. The Barina Creek dredging is a stormwater management. Uh, Barina Creek is out on the far northeast side in Alder Grants District. Um, that pond has been there for about 15 years and does need to um, does need to be dredged out. Uh, it's filling up and not functioning the way that it needs to. Um, so again, just going into some of these other, there's with this proposed roundabout at Packerland and um, Trojan Drive, there's some storm sewer reconfiguration that would be required there. Um, into the Howards uh, of the, the downtown, the Oaklands, um, those streets sit at low elevations, so storm sewer upgrades are extremely costly. Uh, we're looking to upsize already big pipes. Uh, you're at the downstream end, so all of the water from upstream uh, drains down to here. So if we're out in District 1 and we're replacing a 12-inch storm sewer, a 12-inch storm sewer only costs so much money. We get down into the downtown area where these things daylight out at the Fox River, and sometimes we're replacing 80 and 84-inch storm sewer pipes that, as you can imagine, they're substantially more expensive. So then we just go into uh, the resurfacing program and continue on with some of our reconstructs. Uh, the Seymour Park storm facilities, both the east and west facilities. Um, Van Beek. And that's it for major capital on storm sewer parking and sanitary. See the Seymour Park, that's only uh, one side of the park, right? That is, yes. So uh, uh, am I missing it? Is there, I guess, another substantial amount coming in subsequent years? Yes, there will be. Uh, I will have to check on that. The East Side Park uh, project is a million dollars. Okay. And th that's not on here, is it? It is not. Okay. So Diana, when we were talking about things that need to get edited or added, that would be one. And is your plan to do that one in 24? That is up for discussion yet. We still have not come to Parks Department hasn't finalized a design on either of these, east or west. So we still need to get them to commit to, okay, this is what we're having uh, on the east and west side of Ashland Avenue so we can finalize those designs and that'll drive the construction schedule. Okay, understood, thank you. Okay, sanitary. So we have, I don't know if you've seen our combination trucks, but in addition to the flexible hoses, they have some two piece uh, rigid metal pipes uh, that hook up on the suction end. Um, that's our bypass pipes uh, that we need to uh, replace. And then a new sewer camera and tractor uh, for doing closed circuit television uh inspection inside of our sewer that, that's how we get a view inside the inside the sewer lines uh parking utility we've got a phase two on our uh, meter upgrades and replacements uh and some security cameras this year and then storm sewer it looks like we are not looking to buy anything uh, as far as equipment in 23.
Okay, so this is this is our fleet. Uh, so sanitary sewer, we've got a three quarter ton pickup that's due for replacement this year. Um, some of our sewer equipment, especially once we start getting up into three quarter ton pickups, um, in dealing with enterprise and talking to them about the resale value when the lease is up, due to the amount of modification that we have to do to these trucks, uh, it has been decided that some of these vehicles just don't work for the lease program. So some of them we are continuing to outright purchase and run until, um, until they need replacement. Uh, so then parking utility, an enforcement vehicle is typically like a Jeep. Um, and then a midsize pickup, right, as opposed to even a half ton, uh, those are more like the Chevy Colorado size. Uh, storm sewer, we are having an issue with our barge. It's getting very old. So we are looking to supplement the barge with a boat, a working boat, flat bottom with a crane for some of the work that we have to do in the river. Is, is that a purchase? Yes. Okay. All right, committee, any questions? It's a lot to take in. We have a lot of stuff. So I'm glad we, we separated this. <laughs> and as always, if questions come up between now and uh, the next finance committee or when this ultimately goes forward, uh, as additional questions arise, by all means, feel free to give me a call. Okay, uh, if, unless there's any further questions, uh, I think an appropriate motion would just be to hold this until the next meeting. I'll I think move. Galvin whispered that motion. I'll second. <laughs> we have a second by Hutchison. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you, department heads for, uh, for that overview, very helpful. Okay, we are on to item number three. For referral from Ethics Board, the Common Council meeting on August 30th, 2022 to approve a review by cityethics.org for up to $500 of the general ordinance 18-22, repealing and recreating chapter two, article nine, Green Bay Municipal Code relating to ethics as reviewed. Lacey, have you been hanging out just for this item? Uh, yes, but that's okay. Uh, we I'm could doing have other work up ahead. Sorry. No, you're totally fine. I have plenty of other work to do. So this item, I just um, relaying the message from Attorney Bunger uh, was that we have consulted uh, finance, reviewed the budget, and if the committee wishes to move forward, uh, the budget can um, incur the five hundred dollar expenditure. Okay. Have we determined that it's only going to be $500 or is it going to be more? We received an email back uh, with that as the quote for the estimate agreeing that $500 uh, would be the sum that we would pay for a review. It was just an email communication. Sure. And, and how much did we spend on the outside attorney that we've already had review this and go over it? Well, you know, I don't know enough. the number off the top of my head. Um, okay. I did not ask unless uh, Director Ellen Becker knows I can get back to you that um, quickly. I can look it up. If you give me one minute. Sure. Who was the vendor for that? Um, I believe that was Attorney May. And would that all have been in 2022? Or when would we have spent that? 
I think the process started previous to 2022. Let me check. Um, it looks like, sorry, I just sent a message to Attorney Maggard. She said about $6,000. Okay. Faster to ask her than it was for me to look up the file. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yep, sorry for the delay on the answer. Oh, no, no, that's fine. You good with that, Bill? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, approve it and get it going and see what they have to say. Second. All right, we have a motion by Galvin, a second by Burnett. Any further discussion? Seeing none of those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item F, number one, 22 contingency account, 184,297, unobligated, 57,297. Any additional information, Director Allen Becker, you need to share on that? No additional information. Okay. Item two, the next finance committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Uh, please just keep in mind, guys, we're going to be covering um, the other departments as part of that capital improvement plan. Alder Hello, Burnett. Uh, Chairman, um, do, you, do you know if we're planning on meeting in person anytime? Because I think all the other committees, if I'm not mistaken, are meeting in person now. Yep, we've made that request. Um, I guess we were informed that there are still some issues uh, to ensure that we are in compliance with the ordinance um, because council chambers is really the only room that is equipped to be able to offer in person and zoom simultaneously. And so when there is a, a there is a, a conflict, um, then that would potentially mean that the committee is not in compliance with the ordinance. So the recommendation from staff and law, and law department was still to wait for the equipment to be delivered, which my understanding is supposed to be this month. So Director Allenbecker, I see your hand is raised. I do have an update at 9.50 this morning from Director Horanic. committee rooms 604 and 207 are available for hybrid meetings. They were actually in yesterday installing the um, equipment into room 207 and that is the room that we historically have had finance committee in. Um, they are now available for hybrid meetings. Um, it says, he said, if you wish to mention that in your committee or board members, the availability of the two rooms for future use, the only change that needs to be done is that you need to unplug the USB cord to table, whatever directions on how to do it. Um, so, okay. so we can of, be in person next time. Yes, as of yep, starting as of today, they they completed the install for those two committee rooms for hybrid meetings. Okay, that would be my preference, Alder Galvin. You good with that? Absolutely. Okay, so let's plan on that. Thank you for bringing that up, Alder Burnett. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Uh, I don't know. I think that was Galvin and Burnett, maybe. It was like simultaneously. Both, yeah. So yeah. I'll second it. I'll, I'll give them All those motion. in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye.